All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Our release of 2024.1 is right around the corner, and we're going to take a quick look at what's new for this release. This is going to be short and sweet because it is a light release. As we're all aware, the focus is currently on developing the cam. On the subject of the cam, I did want to emphasize that with 2024.1, it will not yet be available publicly. There will be a beta version of the cam available soon, but limited to very specific organizations. So please be sure to speak with your supervisors or department leads before discussing the cam with customers. Just so everyone is aware, the standalone PowerPoint is included within the enablement package. If you need to reference this doc for any reason, you'll find it there. Also, feel free to reach out to me directly if you need clarification on anything. And uh, with that said, let's take a look at 2024.1. The main focus with this release is towards quality of life and user experience updates, so we don't really have a long list of new features. You can find 2024.1's updates listed on this page. We'll start with what I feel are two of the more visible changes in this release. The first is versionless display names and resource files. 2024.1 uh, and onward will introduce a more versionless experience, starting with the removal of version numbers from the application's name in the operating system. This means that application icons, resource folders, and installation folders will simply be designated as Keyshot, which is illustrated to the right of the slide. Going forward, this also means that dev will no longer have to rebuild and retest plugins during each release and there will hopefully be less conversation around plugin compatibility with customers. However, internally, we will still define releases by .1, .2, and .3, uh, and so on. On to the next one. Most of us are likely familiar with image sharpening due to our smartphones and social media platforms. Well, in 2024.1, we've added image sharpening as a new effect to the image tab. The biggest UI change here is that there are two new parameter settings that control the effect. I have those listed on this slide. One is intensity, which essentially just adds contrast to detected edges, and the other is radius, which adjusts how much the effect spreads out from the sharpened edges. Again, this is a pretty common tool in image editing software and mobile apps, so it's very intuitive for most people to use. All right, super quick look at the sharpening feature here. I've put together this scene. It's kind of got a lot of textures and details. That's what's really going to pop when you use the sharpening feature. So we're going to jump over here. We have the image tab open. Under the image tab, under the parameters, we have sharpen. If you go ahead and you click that little arrow, you're going to have the two different settings I was mentioning, intensity and radius. That's under both the basic and the photographic image settings. If we go ahead and we click on sharpen, Nothing's going to happen right off the bat. Everything is at its normal uh, settings. However, you can see when I crank up the intensity that we get one, a lot more noise in the scene, but it really shows a lot more contrast uh, in the details. You can kind of see it up here as well in the texture of the uh, leather material on the chair. That's really popping up up here, down here, as well as on the real cloth. we got a lot of flyaways in here, which is why this kind of uh, goes white. It's, it's, again, a lot of contrast between those edges. And as I was mentioning earlier, radius basically just extends that effect past the detected edges. So you can see that when I crank that up, we're getting that effect over the top here. You can see along most of these edges here. Now we have a really hard white and black highlight and shadow kind of going on on all those edges. So you can see where if I were to very subtly use this, I could increase the details and the realism of my scene, kind of make things pop without having to do too much. All right, the next couple slides are web viewer updates being rolled out at the same time as 2024.1. Here we have our release of WebViewer 5.2. With the release comes a web-based implementation of the configurator. This essentially translates to better performance when you're interacting with your 3D scenes. The configurator has also received some UI UX-based improvements, including better responsiveness to user actions and changes to screen size uh, across your devices, such as going from a mobile-based platform to your PC. Aside from that, support for image sharpening, which we discussed in the previous slide, is included in WebViewer 5.2. We've also improved shadow cast in the latest release. Now, any opacity mapped objects uploaded to the web viewer are going to cast an accurate shadow due to the web viewer now understanding that light should pass through the areas with opacity. And another performance update for web viewer is the addition of frustum calling. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but at the end of the day, this just means that the web viewer only actively processes 3D data that's visible in the web viewer's field of view, which translates to a much higher frame rate and overall better performance. And you can see on the example here that when all the 3D models are visible in the viewer, the frames per second are at seven, 
while when the view is zoomed into a single model, FPS jumps all the way up to 112. And lastly, for WebViewer, by popular demand, we've introduced 3D optional uploads to WebViewer. If you're not familiar with the previous versions, the main component of a WebViewer upload was previously the 3D scene from your Keyshot real-time view. This is now an optional component when uploading, which means customers can now deliver high-quality imagery, XRs, and support data without having to bog the viewer down with a 3D scene if they'd prefer. This just gives customers greater control over data being shared with stakeholders and can help improve performance, particularly if the recipient is on a less than optimal viewing device. On to our material updates, we have two. The first being better responsiveness in the real-time view when modifying materials. In our latest release, this is a significantly faster and smoother experience, which is demonstrated in the video playing on the right of the slide. The left portion of the video shows how the responsiveness feels in pre-2024.1 versions versus the right shows 2024.1 responsiveness. Pay attention to the gem color as it's being adjusted in the color pickers. Aside from that, we've also improved AXF material support. Several issues relating to AXF car paint material have been addressed, and we've added support for specular, normal textures, and roughness textures. But this was uh, mainly to address some issues brought up by Philips and Luxottica, who are both power users of Keyshot and AXF materials. And a quick slide about our latest library updates. Essentially, we've just updated libraries across Keyshot to newer, more up-to-date versions with the raw color library being updated to reflect the current 2024 version of that color system. Now jumping into our last group of updates, which are general quality of life improvements, we've got some updates to our importers for some of the bigger CAD software that our customers use. They are listed here. We've also updated the optics framework that our GPU rendering runs off of to the latest version, version 8. Based on some internal testing, the Optics 8 update improves GPU mode performance by up to about 25%, which is pretty substantial. Along with those updates, we've added Z standard compression. There's a wiki link there in case you're interested in learning more about it. This type of compression has contributed to a substantial reduction in saved file size and a smaller improvement to scene load. Overall, seeing about a 33% reduction in file size from original file sizes, and scene save times are about 10% faster. On this slide, we also have camera refractor updates. This is more a back-end code update to the camera keyframing system. Customer-wise, in the short term, it's just going to give them expanded use of undo and redo relating to keyframing workflows, so they'll be able to use undo and redo outside of just adding and deleting keyframes. And lastly, we have the addition of an auto cleanup function for network rendering. This allows customers to auto delete from the network monitor rather than having to manually delete completed jobs. This basically translates to a faster, easier to navigate and more reliable network monitor and manager. And that's it for our 2024.1 updates. Again, if you have questions about anything in our What's New doc, feel free to reach out via Slack and I'll be happy to clarify anything for you. Thanks everyone.